I'm Dr Sarah Bainan, founder of The Bug Farm here at Lower Hadcloth Farm in St David's in Pembrokeshire. This is the original family farm and the family have farmed here for generations. It's, it's been a, a beef farm most recently, dairy farm previously, as well as arable. Uh, sort of a typical mixed small farm of around about 100 acres. We've done something very, very differently here and we've transformed what we're doing. So rather than primarily growing food for humans, we're growing food and habitats for wildlife and then feeding humans alongside, just as a way to address the current biodiversity mass extinction that we're facing at the moment and a way to, to show really other farmers what you can do on farms to look after the other life that calls your farm home. Here at the Bug Farm, we work with a, a number of other local farmers to grow food on site, whether that be wheat or barley. Um, we have a herd of Welsh black cattle that were traditionally beef cattle. And when we took on the herd, they, they became our, our family members. And so we're really looking at a different role for the cattle here. They're here as our conservation grazers, so they're creating habitat and food for wildlife. And they spend their full lives as a really complex herd structure, conservation grazing the entire site. And it works really well for us that their dung then fertilizes the, the land. Uh, it provides a home for dung beetles and other insects that then provide food for the birds and mammals here on the bug farm. And, and I'm really fascinated to see how we can put a value on our livestock when it's not always looking at, at food for humans. So it's a, it's a real kind of integrative system. We have herbal lays, we have annual crops, we grow a lot of perennial wildflower meadows. And then we're doing big nature recovery projects where we're allowing a lot of our land to, to go back to nature, whether that's active conservation or a form of rewilding, uh, in a way to actually join up two sites of special scientific interest that are internationally renowned for their wildlife with this corridor in between. So we're trying to rejoin them to allow those sites to main, or remain viable for wildlife in the long term. It must have been a real challenge to farm a relatively small family farm productively here over the generations. We have very, very wet, quite heavy soils and a lot of the farm is marshy grassland. And I know as, as farmers, we, we often call that rough land and we, we assign a lower value to it, both economically and, and how we perceive that land. And we're trying to look at it in a very different way. And that land is our rich land. That's our valuable land because that's where the wildlife still is because that hasn't been able to be intensified over the years. So we still have really exciting, very rare wildlife like the small red damselfly here. And in the drier fields, we are now looking at how we can create habitat in those fields because we want to get the balance right in a way that we are growing food for a growing human population, but at the same point, we're, we're not losing those habitats and it's those habitats that have been lost over generations. I mean, 97% of wild flower meadows have been lost since the 1930s. And that's probably because that land can be intensified more easily. It can be converted to largely ryegrass monocultures over the years. And we're looking at, at re-establishing those meadows, but also at in, inputting herbal lays as well as a kind of balance between production and wildlife conservation. We've been really lucky to work with Cotswold Seeds over the years and trial lots of different mixtures, whether they're bespoke mixtures for us or off the shelf mixtures. We've grown a number of the herbal lays, the biodiverse herbal lay, as well as the simple herbal lay. And we've really found that those biodiverse herbal lays in, in drought periods like we're in now, really capture the nutrients and capture the water from deeper in the soil and provide this constant growth of, of forage when everything else is very, very dry. So I would say the herbal lays have been extremely successful and we're, we're converting more of our rotational arable fields into herbal lays as they have a break from arable production. Uh, here behind me, we've got a, an annual uh, wildflower and an agricultural mix. And this is the kind of bling factor. We get a lot of visitors here who want to, to come and, and see wildlife and be infused. And at this time of year, our perennial meadows are looking quite brown. Um, and so in kind of, you know, we're, we're now mid to late August. If we can have this colour to infuse people through the summer holidays, it's a massive tick for us to get people to then go home and, and plant wildflowers and other kind of amenity flowers flowers uh, in their gardens and as such Cotswold Seeds have produced a, a special mixture for us 
that we've given a packet of to every resident in St David's for them to grow a mini meadow in their garden and it contains the annuals so you get that flash of colour, that inspiration in year one and then the perennials that come and provide the longer term meadow. Um, we've, also, we've also grown the, the longer term uh, Cotswold wild flora meadow really successfully. Um, corn marigolds do really, really well here, much to my late father's disgust. He hated corn marigolds. Mum and I love them. Um, and we get that kind of flush in the first couple of years and then they drop out and we don't have any issues with those annual species coming and competing uh, later on uh, when the perennial species are coming through. The knapweed at the moment has been fantastic. Uh, as a, a food source for flocks of goldfinch and linnet and, and lots of really rare birds that we're starting to see come back to the farm that should be here but haven't been here. Um, and something we're doing this year is we're doing a trial with some of the Cotswold seeds clover mixtures. I want to look at where we're planting a woodland uh, across this farm and we've got another 100 acre farm as well and I want to look at how we can reduce herbicide use in the establishment of the trees. So by sowing the clover mixtures we're hoping that that will outcompete the grasses and we won't need to spray around the trees for the first couple of years but we'll know more about that in a, in a few years but we've established the clover mixtures now and they're, they're doing really well spotted with some annual species and then also some of the wild bird seed mixtures as well just to provide a little bit more habitat and food for wildlife in the meantime so it's it's really exciting here to be able to grow all these crops you know linseed we've got buckwheat growing for celia the mixtures the herbal lays some some arable crops and having all that come together on one farm that's what excites me is being able to 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 really farm for wildlife in a way that's sustainable in the long term here at the bug farm we're sandwiched between two sites of special scientific interest they're also special areas of conservation which is a european wide designation for really really important wildlife habitat it's all part of this this network of the northwest pembrokeshire commons special area of conservation and there's a massive gap between them uh, which is generally quite intensive agricultural land so we're actually trying to bring the wildlife back to our farm in a variety of ways. We're, we're digging ponds, we're creating new hedge banks and hedge rows, creating wildflower meadows, managing our marshy grasslands with our cattle. That's a really key point for us here is I don't think we could actually do a lot of the habitat conservation that we do without our herd of Welsh black cattle. They're a key element of, of everything that we do. And then we're working with a number of partners with the National Trust, the Wildlife Trust, Pembrokeshire County Council, uh, with a number of projects where we're, we're actively carrying out this work and then monitoring with a team of ecologists. Although I was a farmer's daughter, I always had this absolute passion for wildlife, particularly the smaller wildlife. And over the years studying to become an entomologist, I realised just how important insects and other invertebrates are. They're, they're the foundations of the systems that we rely on. They keep our soils healthy, they keep our water clean, our air clean, um, and, and yet we often, we don't value them for doing that. And so I decided that I wanted the bug farm to be all about bugs and, and showcasing just how important they are. So we've developed the site. It's not just about bugs, it's essentially a wildlife reserve where we try and gently influence people to, to learn about farming farming, sustainable food production, sustainable eating, the importance of invertebrates. Um, but, but we do this through a tropical bug zoo. So we, you know, we pull people in who maybe aren't that interested in sustainable food and farming, but they want to come and see some giant tarantulas. Um, and if they're on holiday, then we can get that message across uh, gently. And so we have this tropical bug zoo full of extraordinary invertebrates from across the world. We have a museum, an art gallery, and we also look at eating insects as a sustainable source of protein. Because if we're going to leave land for wildlife, we need to look at more sustainable, more efficient ways of farming. Because otherwise we, can't, we just can't afford to leave land where we're not intensively farming it for human food. And, and I think that's, that's so wrong if we're, we're just using our land for us as one species. So by farming insects, you can, you can actually generate a protein that is weight for weight very similar to beef with a fraction of the environmental footprint. You can, you can feed insects on side streams of other plant-based agricultural industries that would otherwise either be wasted or used in a very kind of uh, inefficient way because insects are so efficient at converting their feed into food for us. So we're also here, the home of the UK's first edible insect restaurant, Grub Kitchen, which is a lovely way to just get people in to talk about 
sustainable food. And then we've got a food manufacturing facility where we've developed Vexo, which is an insect and plant-based protein. So it's similar protein to a meat mince, which then can be made into a bolognese, but it contains about 80% less saturated fat and all of the nutrients really required for especially growing children. And we've been working with schools across Wales and across the UK to actually develop that and get that onto school menus. And I think we want to be very clear that it's not about either eating insects or eating meat or eating a plant-based diet, but that it's about the conversation, it's about eating sustainably. And I think what's exciting for us is that this is an opportunity for farmers to diversify, whether it be farming insects or whether using their side streams and increasing the value of those side streams as feed for insects. So I think in terms of the potential of insect farming in the UK, it's a really, really exciting time to add value to our farming.